Thank you everyone for joining us. We're starting just a couple of minutes late, which means we're probably going to go just a couple of minutes over the mark. I would love to know where everybody's coming from. So if you want to write something into the chat, you can see at the bottom there of the screen, you can write in where you're from. That, that makes it fun for me to know where everyone's joining us from. All right, Virginia, Delaware, Nebraska, Oklahoma, California, Idaho Falls, Georgia, North Carolina, Texas, Utah, Texas, love it, Missouri, California, California, Alabama, Canada. Yeah, international. That's great. Uh, Manitoba. That's a place I haven't been. Uh, Michigan, Hungary. Wow, we jumped the ocean. That's wonderful. Wyoming. Great. Well, keep adding those in there and everybody can see where everyone's coming from. That's so much fun to have you. So we are at a very interesting time in the history of the world. We are in this time where everyone is confined to their homes, um, businesses are changing, canceling, um, schools are canceling, and so we've got our children home with us when maybe some of us wouldn't normally have our children home with us, and things are seeming a little bit out of the ordinary, right? And so um, the whole point in me making this was to try to help in that situation. So I've got to tell you, I went to Texas this last weekend. So a week ago, I was in Texas. Yay, people from Texas. And um, during this conference that I was at in Texas where I was speaking, things got canceled and I had to come home. And that was the time when everything here in the United States started changing because of government mandates and shutting things down school and such and all that kind of thing. And that was a really interesting um, feeling, kind of an ominous feeling, like what is going on? Yeah, thank you. I was going to go to Greenville this weekend. I was supposed to be in Greenville, right? Today, the last couple of days I was going to be there and um, I'm sorry I didn't make it there. Thank you for, for coming with us. But I gotta tell you something cool that happened right before I went to speak in Texas. And, and I feel like this is the spirit behind why I'm doing this whole thing anyway in the first place. Oh, I forgot to set my timer so that I self-govern and only go 45 minutes. You know what that means. I might go a couple of minutes over that. We'll try, try my best to stick to self-governing on the time there. Anyway, um, when I was in, well, when I was on my way to Texas, I looked down at my shoe and I thought, okay, I've got this strap on my shoe that has been mostly broken for a year. And I don't think I can go to Texas and then the next week Greenville and then the next week Missouri and just keep doing, you know, conference after conference for these three weeks in a row here with a shoe that looks like it's going to break. And I thought, why have I been dealing with this for so long? And so I'm sitting in the airport before I even leave on my flight for Texas and I, I'm looking for people who could fix shoes in Dallas. Like I thought, okay, I'm going to land in Dallas. I'll find a shoe repair person. There's got to be one in a town that size. And so I found this little guy and I gave him a call and said, Hey, are you going to still be open when I land? And he said, yeah, for a little bit. And I said, okay, well, I've got this shoe. I've got this problem. I'm coming in and I need to wear these shoes. And he didn't speak very much English, but he said, okay, sweetest little guy. Um, probably originally from Mexico or somewhere. And anyway, and I said, okay, well, I found him and I went into his shop, which looked like something out of the 1950s at best, maybe even the 1930s. He was an older guy. I mean, shoe repairman, how many people do that anymore? Right? So it was an older trade and you know, he had all these really old machines and old pictures on the walls. And I mean, it just looked like this place has never been renovated or if so, it's been so long ago, you know, he's just kind of living out the rest of this job until he he's done and he retires for good or whatever. And, and I, I bent down and I took off my shoe and I handed him the shoe and he said nothing to me. I said, oh, I'm the lady that called and here's my shoe. He said nothing, he just took my shoe and then he went back to his back room and I heard some machines going for just a quick second and he came back out and he said, how's that? That's what he said to me. And, and I looked at the shoe and it was fixed better than I'd got it from the shop. And he'd done it in a couple of seconds and I said, oh wow, I am so grateful. I said, thank you so much because I have to wear these for like weeks in a row here. And I was really afraid I'd have a problem. I said, how much do I owe you? 
And he goes, ah, don't worry about it. And I said, no, really? I mean, I'm looking around the shop thinking, I would love to contribute to this business, <laughs> you know, because it's a little outdated and stuff like that. And I was like, no, really, how, how much? This, is, this has saved me. I am happy to pay. I can pay you. And he says, ah, don't worry about it. And he turns and walks away. And I had to hold myself back from tears. I thought that is goodness. That is straight up goodness. And um, I felt like, the, what, what kind of a wonderful world do we live in where a person just saw me take the shoe off my foot, knowing I needed it that second, didn't make me wait for anything, and he just did a kindness like that. So in the spirit of that kindness that that man showed me last weekend in Dallas, Texas, when all of this stuff started going down, and can't go here, can't go here, don't go to the restaurant. This, there's runs on the stores. I'm going to the bank and they're saying, oh, we don't have that much cash to give out now. And, you know, and, and stuff like that where all these people are, are experiencing massive changes in their normal flow of the society. Um, I, I am giving this today because there is something that, there's a way that I have lived my life for so many years that um, is able to give back to people during this time. For my entire life um, of raising my children, I have had for, for 24 years now, just about, I'm almost at 24 years of having, having a child. For 24 years, I've had the children with me every day underfoot. And I have accomplished great things and we've had a great environment and everybody's been there and I didn't need to have them anywhere else. And, and I know how to make a really enriching environment. I know how to stop the problems that are happening at people's homes and which I know are occurring right now in some people's families. So there's so many of you on, I don't know who's not muted, but I occasionally hear sounds from somebody's house. So if you could please, um, check i just muted eva gordon but if you could please just keep things muted unless you unless we get to the q a time and we're going to have questions that would be really awesome so anyway i want to share with you today something that i hope well in fact multiple things that i hope are going to help you during this time of we'll call it crisis but it doesn't necessarily need to be a crisis but that's what everybody feels like it is right now with your families i feel like there's a lot that i can give and share i'm going to share with you for you know about 40 minutes here um some stuff that i've prepared and then after that we'll have some question and answer now i see somebody already has their hand raised it says somebody named heidi has their hand raised and I don't know what your question is, Heidi, if it's super important regarded to, regarding to, you know, some problem you're having, go ahead and, and just unmute yourself and say something right now. If not, we'll, we'll let you go first. Oh, Heidi's hand is not raised anymore. Maybe she didn't know that her hand was raised. Okay, it's kind of hard to run this big of a classroom on um, this type of a platform. I'm gonna do the very best I can and still get through all of the information that I need to. So let's talk about what's happening. Um, are any of you, maybe you can type it into the chat, are any of you a little bit, or, or have you been a little bit worried? Or have you been a little bit afraid about how long is this going to go? Or what are we going to do if this is super long term, if the schools don't open again, or or whatever. Now, I know we have some people on here who are probably homeschoolers, some people here who've had children in charter schools, private schools, public schools, all different kinds of schools here. Um, uh, I will find that, Tammy, that, that shoe shop. In fact, um, it's on my personal Facebook page. I've got the name of it on there because I did a quick live after he did that. Anyway, um, so I'm wondering, you know, what, is, what exactly are we experiencing right now? If there's one thing that I can tell yourself or, or tell, tell myself during this time is there's no need to stress. We shouldn't stress. There's good people around us all the time. Um, stress and worry are normal things that can happen, but they are absolutely your enemies. They shut you down. And everybody knows that they shut, them, that they shut themselves down when they start experiencing stress and worry. 
because stress and worry are actually based on lies. The lie that things aren't going to work out right, that things aren't going to um, be good enough, that somehow you're not going to be able to take it, whatever the stress is, whether it's the children arguing, whether it's being, you know, getting some cabin fever, whether it's, um, you know, not being able to help them with their math work or something like that that they're experiencing. Those things are all lies. And, and I want you to know that because you absolutely have more capacity than you ever give yourself credit for. Every human does. Every human can always do more than they think. In fact, as you have more experiences and as you learn more skills, your capacity will naturally increase. I'm gonna say that one more time. As you have more experiences and as you learn more skills, your capacity will naturally increase. So this is a time where people can either shut down or they can choose to have their capacity increase. And when I say choose to, I mean that. It is an absolute choice that we have to have our capacities either grow or not. So we have to say to ourselves, surely there's more I ca I'm capable of. Instead of saying to ourselves, this is all I can take. Because if you start telling yourself, this is all I can take, you are setting yourself up to emotionally fall. And if you emotionally fall, your whole family is going to fall around you. Because the parents actually are the ones that maintain that emotional stability for the family. As, emotion, as emotionally healthy and strong as a parent is, is the same that your children will be also. So keep that in mind. You are able to be the ones who maintain the steadiness, who maintain the calmness to be okay. Anytime a person chooses to be stressed or worried, they're actually choosing to be selfish. At that moment, now I, I don't, I hate to say that to people because I know some people are like, I deal with stress all the time. What are you saying? I'm a selfish person and I'm saying, not necessarily, you're probably giving and serving all the time. But the moment when you become stressed, you are thinking only about how you feel, how things are in fact impacting you, what you think you're capable of, what you think you can't do, the list of things you have to do, and it's all pointed at you, 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 you. So what do you do? What do you do when you're feeling stressed or when you're feeling worried? Because it can happen during these times and we can't let it occur. We have to stop ourselves from those feelings. You can say, whoa, that's stress. So the one thing you need to know is how do I feel stress? You've got to ask yourself that. How do you feel stress or worry? What happens to you? Do you get a certain thought that pops into your head? Do you start getting tense in the neck? Do you start pacing around? Do you start getting short-tempered with people and not listening to what other people have to say? What is it that you do? Now, back it up. Whatever that thing is, it is if you know you get short-tempered, then probably the thing you need to back it up to is when i when i'm thinking to myself i don't have time for this cuz that that's what happens before you you act out with your short temper there's some thought that goes through your mind you've got to find that spot the earliest trigger that you can find for yourself the earliest thing you know you do as it starts to build up to you losing it because there's no need for you to lose it you can choose not to you can pray for help too. I'm a prayer. Be sure you do that part, okay? But find that thing. If it's the thought of, I don't have time for this, or this is taking too long, or whatever it happens to be, use that as your trigger and tell yourself, the moment I think that thought, I will stop. And I will take myself to my calm place. You've got to have a plan. What is your calm place? Is it a rocking chair in your room? Is it on your knees in prayer? Is it singing a song or humming a, a, a song that you need? Is it a little, is it a little walk out in the, in the yard, in the garden to, to get yourself just, you know, 
seeing things more clearly in perspective. What is it? You've got to have that plan. You've got to tell your children, you know what? I'm going to stop right now. I'm going to talk to you in a minute, but I've got to get myself completely calm first. And then while you get yourself calm, then you have to plan. This is exactly what I will say. And I'm going to try to get into some things that you can say today, some, some skills for some words that you can say so that you do not fall into the old script that you have. Every single one of us is a robot. Okay, already we program ourselves. We create programming and habits, tracks for our brain to go on. There is something that goes through our head. There is a, a phrase that comes out of our mouths. Maybe it's what you were what what were you thinking? Or or you know, why are you having such an attitude? Or there's something that we say regularly. We programmed ourselves to say that. So we have to program ourselves to say something different than that. We have to choose how to handle it differently. And probably we're missing a little bit of skill development. And I'm going to talk sometime to, uh, at some point here in this call about skill development. And then the things that we say in our skills, and, and you'll hear this in the skills that I talk about today, um, they need to be only the truth. Okay, only the truth. Nothing emotional. Nothing about how you feel even if you feel that, that your feelings are a truth for you. Talking about how you feel in the moment when you're trying to solve a problem is not the time to talk about how you feel, okay? It isn't. First, you get everybody to calmness. You declare the truth. The truth is, this is what I told you you had to do. This is actually what you did. This is causing a communication breakdown because the right thing didn't happen. So let's point it back to what the right thing is. Okay, now is there anything else I need to understand? That's when the children can disagree appropriately with you, which is a skill that we can teach them how to use so that then you can come to an understanding of possible feelings and those kinds of things. But when a person is being oppositional, that's not a time to share feelings. When a person is being stressed, that is not a time to share feelings. If you start sharing feelings during a time of opposition or worry or stress, those will only be power struggles every time, every single time. I hope this helps you. I, I'm trying to help you diagnose what's going on inside of you when things are falling apart around you at home. So we're going to get into some nuts and bolts that I don't usually get to share with people. And one of those things that I want to share with you, and you may not necessarily embrace this at first, but I hope you will. I speak at a lot of homeschool conferences because I'm a homeschooler, okay? I've always homeschooled my children. For years and years, I've done this. Uh, they've always gone to uh, my home school, okay? Except for my foster children who went to public school. So I have experience having students at the public school as well. And my father was a public school teacher and I certainly went to the public school. I know how things go, okay? And I know what's happening right now. Um, there are a lot of people right now who have all of these mandates from the school, Okay, uh, you got to do this with your children. You got to do this and this. And they got to turn this in and they got to submit this and they got to check that they actually saw their class for today or whatever it is. And basically everyone has turned like all the people who've been doing, say, public school or charter schools or, or private schools. They all now are online schoolers. Okay, but I want you to consider something. And this is something that I always share with people. I always say every single parent is a homeschooler. Whether they like it or not, every single parent is a homeschooler. You are the ones that get to show your children what it means to live a fulfilled adult life. That is your sacred post. You get to do that. It's a beautiful thing. And so remember that in this moment and homeschooling by the way you being a homeschooler has nothing to do with being the taskmaster for the school and for their online program okay if that's what you're involved in right now that's not what it means to be a homeschooler and so what i would like to share with you right now is what it really means to be a homeschooler to really have the heart of homeschooling so this week I just up and created a site and the site is called the heart of homeschool.net the heart of homeschool.net and that's because next weekend on Saturday one week from today I'm gonna do 
a, a homeschool conference all about the heart. Oh, I'm not going to call it a conference. We'll call it a seminar. It's a one day seminar. There's going to be me and some other teachers there. And we're going to talk about the heart of your home and the heart of your homeschool. Because even if you're doing online stuff requirements for the school, you don't have to just be an online schooler who's the taskmaster for the school. You can have something way more during this time. In fact, if you do have something more enriching, more nourishing for your children, then you will create a home culture that can last forever, no matter where somebody's going to school. You could change your relationships. They could become so powerful just because of the slight modifications that you make at home. So let's talk about culture, home culture. The word culture comes from the Latin word culture, which means to train something up, okay? To train something up, to nourish something. It means teaching. It also means correcting. Because if you have a little uh, culture, okay? A little um, garden, say, for instance, it's gardening time. Great, great homeschool thing to do, plant a garden, you know? Um, that plus, it, you never know what the future brings. Plant a garden. <laughs> Let's learn from World War II, victory gardens and all that, okay? Anyway, um, hey, listen, I have no problem promoting prepping. What wise person would be like, eh, I'm just going to wait it out. No, 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 no. Get ready and teach the children to get ready because you know what? It actually promotes security. They're processing a lot of stuff right now. And a lot of that stuff has to do with fear. If you give them a whole bunch of adult skills and you prepare them for anything, they will find more and more confidence at the end of your hand with all these things you're holding their hand through that you're doing. So anyway, let's, let's talk about culture here. Culture means to nourish, to train, to correct, just like you would do with a little plant, with a little tree that you would maybe plant in the ground and you would train it up. You would correct it if it starts going the wrong way with its little supports and stuff like that. That's what you would do. But well, that's what it means to have a really enriching home culture. Now, your home culture can get taken over by other cultures. I don't know if you noticed that, but there is a culture called pop culture which comes through the media, sometimes for, through friends, which is a social culture that can actually infiltrate your home culture. So I have met parents that are homeschoolers that have a great home culture. I've also met parents that are homeschoolers that have a pop culture that's running everything. And they don't have the right influence and family relationships that they should have. I have known public schoolers who have a fantastic home school, a uh, home culture, who their home is what is most important. The, the assignments for the school, what college they're going to get into is not number one on their list. No. Number one on their list is who they are as a group, who they are as a family, and what, and what their bonding is like, and what their future as a group is like. I know public schoolers who can do that and who've made incredible home cultures. But I also know many public schoolers who just buy into the norm social culture and the norm pop culture and, because they don't want to be different or something like that. And then they give up the opportunity to plan their own home culture. So I want you to do a quick assignment and we're going to do it quick because I got a lot to share in a little bit of time. But I want you to do a quick assignment if you've got a piece of paper, okay? And I want you to write down what you want your home culture to be like right now during this time of pandemic right now during the the some people are very um isolated in their homes what do you want the home culture to be like what do you want the relationships to be like how do you want it to feel what does it need to look like for the, the security and the happiness of your family So take a second and write that down. Maybe some lists of words are going to come to your mind. Just write down those lists of words, you know? It doesn't have to be. And don't be afraid of adding more than five things on your list, okay? Wonderful. Thank you. You're writing things down. Um, now, the next question I want you to ask yourself is, what is your end goal going to be if you are the primary educator of your children, which right now you are? Because even though the school is saying, do this, do this, do this, you are the person with your hands on the ground. You are the person talking about the assignment. You are the person scheduling the day. 
You are the person telling everybody when is things are going to happen and when they're not going to happen. You are the educator right now, whether you like it or not. You cannot take the post and let the children run wild, or you can take the post. So what is the end goal of the education in your home going to be? Whether they go back to public school some point or not, what is the end goal going to be for you? Let me tell you my end goal. Years ago when I was doing foster care, because I did foster care for many years for troubled teens, I decided I, they're never going to be perfect. And my own children are never going to be perfect either because children just, well, they're not perfect. That's how it goes. <laughs> and so um, that would go against what being a, ch a child means to learn and to grow and everything else. So I decided I was going to create joyful adults who knew what their mission in life was and couldn't wait to fight for it and had solid relationships with God and family. I was going to create a type of person that was going to come out of my home, a type of an adult that would know who they are, where they came from, what is right, what is wrong, what is good, bad, true, false. That was going to be the type of person that I was going to create. Not just a person who knew their times tables or not just a person who could do 30 minutes of reading a day. Because what's the point of that? What's the point of that? They need to be a good person. The assignments for the school cannot be the goal. The college can't be the goal. A perfect child can't be the goal. The type of adult we are creating has to be our goal. How many times I've asked myself, do parents unintentionally ruin their relationships with their children and create contention in their homes because they are working to accomplish somebody else's goals? The school's goals, the pop culture's goals, the society's goals, the government's goals. What are we doing? That's called giving up your identity, giving up your role as a parent. I have a whole book on roles called Roles because so many people seem to be forgetting who they are in the lives of their families. And I didn't realize that was such a problem until I wrote this book, which is the main one I'm known for for my parenting stuff, Parenting in House United. When I wrote that, I realized um, people kept asking me questions that they didn't really know what their role was. And, and why don't they know what their role is? Because they're giving it up to something else. To the child, maybe. So let's talk about our family culture. A family culture has three aspects to it, basically. I mean, I'm summing it up. You could add more aspects than these three. But I'm going to give you three main categories for the, for the family culture. There's subcultures to the family culture or, or aspects to the family culture. And we could break them out e to even smaller cultures. But for brevity, we're going to hook it into three. So if you think of others, don't think I don't know them. Just think I'm hooking them all together, okay? Number one is the academic culture. So let's talk first about that. In your family, whether you homeschool or public school or whatever other kind of school, you have an academic culture for your family. There's a way that you see learning. Usually part of this academic culture is your spiritual culture okay that would be another culture that you could say that you have but i'm hooking this into the academic culture the way you believe what you think is right or wrong or good or bad those kinds of things that's part of your academic culture um part of this academic culture is going to be things you do every day like scriptures prayers theological discussions that kind of stuff it's going to be one of the ways that your family surrounds yourselves with light and truth and things that are good it's going to be the things that inspire your family to become better people if there is one thing you should teach your children academically meaning appealing to their logic it's why and how to be a good person why and how to be a good person person. That's important. That's more important than math. I would rather have my children know how to be a good person and love that than know trigonometry or even geometry, even though I think geometry is pretty awesome. But I, I, I would rather have them know that. So surround yourselves with light. Okay. That's important. In fact, in our family, the very most important thing that we do every day is called our family canon. And this is where we pray, we read scriptures, we say our family mission statement together, and we maybe even work on memorizations, maybe scriptural memorizations or other documents, proclamations, things um, that we might memorize together as a family. That 
is more important than anything else we do the whole day. More important than eating food, more important than chores, more important than anything. If we don't cover any other academics the whole day, but we did family canon, then I feel like we have been a success. Sorry, my arm keeps going up and down and all over the place because I've got some notes that I'm trying to actually follow so I stay on task here. Anyway, um, so spiritual culture. Um, the second part of our academic culture is our liberal arts, okay? And that's the part that most people think of. So liberal arts is reading, writing, calculating, speaking. Those are all the kinds of things that we associate with school. And those are important. They are important for a person's future freedom, for them to be able to express ideas. But do you know what leads to um, success in these things more than anything else? The speaking. Oftentimes with our schooling, with our children, we say, go do that writing, go do that math, go do that reading. And we never talk about it. We just check it off the list. It's the speaking that promotes more freedom than anything else. How do I share my ideas with the world? What am I doing right now? I'm speaking to you. I'm telling you the things I know and that I understand. That is what all powerful people do. You look at people that, that get elected to, as, to office for president. There have been some people that have become presidents where I'm like, if you hadn't studied how to get, get a, a good speech, no one would vote for you. It's the truth. Speaking is that important. And guess who teaches a person to speak the very most? not the school, the home. And that means you have to be discussing all the time, reading, discussing, writing, discussing, figuring, discussing, 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 disgusting. That's funny. I said the wrong word. Anyway, okay. <laughs> so maybe it is disgusting sometimes when you discuss. And some of the children won't like it at first, which means you have to be willing to sit there in silence and wait for them to come up with something. Okay. The second part of your academic culture, I'm not second, we're at third now. Third part of your academic culture is your life skills. These are your adult skills. Uh, things you can't learn other places like how to fix the car, how to grow the garden, how a baby grows and develops when they're a baby. If you've got little ones and you're like, I can't do this, I've got toddlers. If you can do this with you when you have toddlers, you could be a homeschooler forever. Trust me. If you can nurse and read to a child at the same time, you can homeschool forever. Okay? That's, that's the hardest time of life to do any of this. Um, teach them how to start a business. Teach them to, you know, have a podcast, to make food, to sew clothes, to... Uh, do basic mechanics to build things, teach them skills. These are all things that are academic that the schools hardly touch. Do you realize the, the, uh, the ability that you have right now as the homeschooler of your children to teach them things that will light their fire like nothing they can get on those online assignments? Nothing. Do a photography class. Do something exciting, and you don't have to have read a book about it or have a degree about it. You've taken pictures. Show them how. Do something awesome. Use the filters on your phone. Have a good time. Post something every day, everybody's picture of the day. Anyway, another part of your academic culture is projects and goal setting, okay? Um, so working on projects as a family, setting goals together as a family, this is super important. It's not something that the schools excel at, okay? So have them set goals for themselves. We have these meetings, we call them mentor meetings, where I meet with the children each week and we talk, we set goals for themselves in the different areas of their life and then they plan, this is what I wanna do. You can do that right now. You don't have to be Nicolene Peck and you don't have to be already been a homeschooler to do that. And if you already have been a homeschooler, Maybe you want to do it too. Anyway, so have a meeting with your children and make goals for themselves and take on big projects. You've got all the time. Nothing is taking your time right now. Get out the macaroni and do something with it. Start with necklaces when they're like four, okay? Then move on to like telescopes. I don't know. Do something with the stuff that you've got. I mean, toilet paper rolls can do almost anything, right? We know that. Anyway, learn the stuff that you want to learn. I think that's the most important thing that I could say academically. If you're going to be an inspiring teacher for your children, it's not inspiring to say, go to the computer and do that assignment. That's not inspiring. Just ask them. 
They won't like it after the first couple of weeks, maybe even the first couple of days. I'll tell you what's inspiring is to say, you know what? This is what I've always wanted to learn. I've always wanted to learn French and I think I'm going to learn it right now because we're not going anywhere and we can eat lunch in French every single day and we can whatever, just, just like do something for yourself, learn something. Oh, you always wanted to learn crochet, go to that craft box, pull out that yarn that is ugly. You're never going to use for anything and just start working on it. Just start sewing things, you know? Probably there has not been a run on yarn. I bet you you could still buy yarn at the store. Seriously, think of it. No one's thinking of yarn right now. You could go and get that. There's probably a few things at the craft store you could get your hands on because everybody's just worrying about going to the bathroom right now. Okay, so anyway, let's move. So, so do something fun for yourself. Okay, the next culture that we're going to talk about is our social culture. Now, I know you're thinking, yeah, that's the one that's the problem. We're not with our friends. We're not doing anything fun right now. Okay, hello. The family relationships set the stage for social health, okay? They are the number one foundational culture, social culture, that a person ever has. They're born into the world, and they have your family as a social culture. There are three different ways that a person learns social development. They, they either learn it from their same age peers, they learn it from the media, or they learn it from you. Which way do you want your children to learn social? Right now, they can still learn from all three of those ways because of technology. Are you going to put the family as first in the social development? I hope you do. I hope you say, this is the perfect time for our family to really get on board with who we are. In this book that I already held up before, Parenting House United, I talk about deciding what type of a family you want to be and creating a vision for your family. Make that plan. Who are we? What are we going to be doing during this time as a family? And then go toward that. So people also for their social culture, their social development, they need skills, social skills. So that book I just held up has tons of skills in it for problem solving. If a person can problem solve, that's proper social development. If they have an attitude problem, that is not proper social. Okay. If they have a tantrum, that is not proper social. So that's important. So um, these books here, many of you know that I have these, are these children's books. They each teach one of four basic skills for children. One of them is following instructions, accepting no answers, accepting consequences, and disagreeing appropriately. If a person learns all four of those four basic skills, that takes care of 99% of their behavioral problem. And you know what? Next week at the event that I'm going to be doing called the heartofhomeschool.net uh, conference, which you can go and sign up for, it's live today. If you go to homes, heartofhomeschool.net, um, Next Saturday, I will go into detail about how to correct problems and how to teach those four basic skills because those correction skills are other things that people need to know. So for this week, what I'm wanting you to do is just to know that there are things that you can do and that you can get yourself calm and not dive into the power struggle with them. You can, you can decide what the proper social is. You can start getting your cultures identified and start working deliberately on those things. We're going to talk about some fun things that you can do also with the children here coming up. And then next week, we'll get even deeper into more nuts and bolts about how you can really um, expand these cultures. If you want to join us for that, you're obviously not required to. So one thing I want to share with you on this social culture is contention kills connection. Okay. If you want to have a good family bond, a good connection as a family, you can't have contention. Contention kills it every time. And the thing that the children remember is the highest drama moments. So they remember the contention as if it happened 10 times, even only if it happens once. And the connection, they don't remember, like they remember it one for one. So you have to do lots and lots of connection, lots of hugs, lots of talks, lots of taking time to allow them into your everyday moments and not 
that much contention. In fact, try to get rid of all contention because that kills the whole culture, the whole social culture that's happening in your home. A proper social culture will help people mature in productive ways. You want your children to become those autonomous adults who have those great relationships, who are doing great things with their lives, just like I do. That means you've got to help them mature and learn how to solve problems. The best way to do that is within the family. If they can't solve problems in their own family, they cannot solve problems anywhere. One of the things that you can do right now this week is praise more. Praise the good things. Notice everything good that's happening. Praise them for saying okay, for getting something done quickly, for telling you something got accomplished, for keeping calm about something that was hard. Praise them for all of those things and tell them exactly what happened. The final culture that I want to talk about today is the entertainment culture that you have as a family. My goodness, I turned off my. Okay, I just lost track of my timer. So now I'm going to have a hard time self-governing, guys. I'm going to do the best I can. I'm trying to keep track. Anyway, um, and I know we started a few minutes late. So hopefully we'll end here pretty close to on time. Entertainment culture. So now leisure is an interesting word. In the old days, leisure used to just mean what you did when you were off work. And for many people, leisure meant study. It meant reading our books having family discussions with each other, working on a family project. That was all considered leisure. Nowadays, when we think of leisure, we think of like what I call fat dogging it, like, uh, like kicking back and doing nothing, you know? That's what we usually think of as leisure now, like, oh, somebody serve me, entertain me, stimulate me. And we just turn to pudding and then we put on a screen. We've got to be so careful about that because the, spree the screens bring a whole new culture into our homes. And so be careful about what you're going to be viewing, you know, always, um, so that it doesn't destroy your culture. Make sure you discuss any differences in culture that you see in these shows. Even if your kids are like, oh, mom, do you have to discuss everything? And you, I, I do, you know, that's just like who I am. I, I don't, I'm not doing my job right. If, if we're not discussing, so sorry, we're going to have a little talk about this, you know. Um, the whole point is that then when they get older, they have this, this like, Oh, you know what? I see that. I see that. I see that. Who taught them to see? You. Your discussions taught them to see. So don't worry about if they act like they don't like the discussions. So what do you do for entertainment if you're not going to do screens that much, which I hope most people are choosing during this time. I know that's a hard choice to make when we're home a lot. And usually when we're home, maybe we watch screens. I hope you're playing more. I hope you're planning fun events to have. You're like, we're going to have a party and it's going to be so great. And who's going to be there? Everyone that lives in our house. It's going to be awesome. Okay. We're going to study Mother Goose Friends. We're going to all memorize one. We're going to dress up as a character with all the weird clothes that we can find. We're going to make hot cross buns and peas porridge and whatever it is. And we're going to, we're going to have a Mother Goose party and we're going to play Mother Goose Mad Libs and we're going to play, you know, I mean, have a party, have a big event. You don't have to do that somewhere else or with someone else that doesn't live at your house in order for it to be awesome. And I know because I've done it for 23 years. Anyway, just, just do it, just have fun. Be spontaneous, be silly. Um, teach your children things too about your past. Teach them games you played, stories, tell them stories of things that you did when you were young. You know, that's awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna share with you a list. I'm gonna copy and paste it really quick here. Uh, and I'm gonna share with you a list of a whole bunch of activities. Okay, and I'm just gonna let you look at it really quick and I'm just gonna run through them like, nobody's business because I don't have time to explain every single one of them, but I'm hoping that you, or if your children are um, listening or something like that, that you will be able to get some ideas from this. So let's see if I can copy and paste a list this large on this page. I, I honestly have my doubts, so we'll see what happens. Oh boy, let's stretch it out. I wonder if we can. Can we stretch it? Whoop. Okay, list of fun family activities. I wonder if I can scroll through this list that it's gonna just go down the bottom of the page. I don't think I'm gonna be able to do it. Okay, well, here's a few of them anyway, right at the start, and then I'm gonna, I'll just tell you the rest of them. So first off, okay, if it's a windy day, we're in the spring, 
make your own kites and fly them. You don't have to buy them. Plus, there's probably not a run on kites. You actually probably could go buy kites if you wanted to, but fly kites, you know? This is arts and crafts and science, okay? Have your own chopped television show or your own nailed it baking television show, okay? This have someone be the filmer, someone, you know, and the producer of the show, some other people compete and have mom and dad judge, you know, or maybe mom and dad even compete with certain teams, okay, and they help. This is science, this is life skills, this is TV production. Go for nature walks or nature scavenger hunts. This is science. And um, this turns your, your, your regular outside activities into something learning. Um, have your house become a town and have money and checks and each of you have your own business, you know, and that's math and social science and entrepreneurialism. I mean, they're gonna have to write you a check to get lunch at mom's cafe, you know, make your own clubhouse or your own go-kart. Now's the time. They've wanted to do it forever in that big tree. Just do it right now. Go find scrap wood, put some things together. That is life skills, science, math, make a potato cannon and shoot stuff out in the desert or, or over in the mountains in the hills or whatever. Um, make a marshmallow gun and have a war in the backyard yard there might i don't know about mini marshmallows at the store but see what you can find you might even be able to get them on on amazon um we already talked about having a mother goose party write short stories and have family story hour where everyone gathers together in their nicest clothes and they have a very poised story time where everyone shares and applauds properly you know just so um make oobleck that's science uh, if you haven't seen oobleck just google it watch the videos on it even watch the videos on oobleck is going to be inspiring for the family play with mud have an etiquette dinner um Let's see what else we got. Make bread or cinnamon rolls from scratch. That's life science, you know, for you. Um, have a sequential spelling bee. If you look up what sequential spelling is, you, you teach a, a person a word like, um, you know, like B. And so spell the word B, B-E. Spell the word B like bzz, like a B, B-E-E. -E. Spell the word being like I'm B. B-E-I-N-G. Okay, spell the word begin. B-E-G-I-N. Spell the word, you know, that kind of stuff. I, I could put them on Facebook. Thank you, Valentine, for asking that. I will try to do that. Um, anyway, so here's some, and it's fun to have a spelling bee. You just have it every day. <laughs> Why not? Just spell stuff. Who cares? You know, or have them read their own books and pick out their own spelling words. You don't have to have some main master list, but if you want one, guess what? They're on Google. You can find a list for any grade. It's no big deal. It's not like the teacher invented the wheel, okay? It's everything. It's everywhere. Um, make a book quilt. What's a book quilt? That means you take a piece of paper like this, you divide it into four sections, you draw a picture of the book, you, draw your, you write a little teeny report of the book, you study something about the book, like maybe swans or something, if you're going to read Trumpet of the Swan by E.B. White. Um, and then, you know, over here, you put something about trumpets, you know, and you do little studies and you read a book and, and make a unit study about the stuff in the book. I mean, like easy peasy, right? You can do the same thing with lap books. I could pull out some of my lap books, but anyway, maybe I'll show them to you next week because I'm going to talk more about what I do in my homeschool next week at the, at the event that we're going to be having there. Um, Lap books is the next one. You can carve wood or soap, create your own bar board game or card game. And we have done that so many times. We have a game called Bones that I made, a game all about the 50 states. Um, you know, there's just so many things. Play yard games, make a pinata. Who doesn't like playing with the uh, flour and water and newspapers, you know, which no one's going to come pick up now, probably. And just, just use them, you know, paper mache, um, make a neighborhood service plan, go out and serve people in your neighborhood somehow, weed their gardens or something, plant your own garden, paint rocks, you know, make pets. That's good. If you can't go to the zoo, you know, just like make your own pets and their rocks and just find them. Study the stars, get out some binoculars, look at the, the craters in the moon at night, um, learn night games, teach them the ones from your past, make your own Easter baskets. We've done that twice. Uh, we've made Easter baskets out of fabric. They're square shape. Um, that's probably something I could, I could give directions for. We've also made them out of rope and fabric where we've wrapped them in and tied them and we've made these coil Easter baskets, which are cool. Make homemade candy. 
make a rock or a bug collection, start a family podcast, start selling things on Amazon or eBay, um, write letters to people, grow a butterfly, make salt dough, eat weird things, you know, make foods from other countries, have your own geography days where you study different places, um, memorize all the countries on a continent. See if you can do that for the next couple of weeks. Soon you'll have the whole world memorized. Your children will like ace every history class they ever go to and they'll know what they're reading about when they say in Nicaragua, blah, blah, blah. They'll be like, I know where that is. It's right here. You know, and they'll actually know something. That's kind of cool. Um, anyway, read and discuss. And the most important thing you could do, I could star this a million times, is to uh, read to your children. Read them a story. Pick books. Do you see? Do you see where I'm sitting here? Here's books. Okay, lots and lots of books. Even more books. You know, um, read books to your children, and pick the ones out that you feel like they wouldn't necessarily pick themselves. Have it be something fun. Oh my goodness, my, I, I unplugged my computer by lifting it up for you. Anyway, pick something that you. Um, think that they think it would be fun, but something that like has some substance to it. There's a difference between a class classic book that makes you a better person, you know, um, like reading uh, Archimedes in the Door of Science or The Red Scarf Girl or A Little Princess or something like that and, and reading something that's twaddle. Okay, that really doesn't make you a better person in any way. And so try to read something meaningful and have good talks with your children about it and, and read other inspirational things. The last thing I want to share with you is about scheduling. Okay, you need to have a plan for what you're going to do here with this schooling. Um, if you just kind of like wake up whenever you wake up and then you tell them they have to go do stuff and then by the time you're done telling them everything they have to do it'll be like time for dinner or time for bed and then you'll be like well that was exhausting and certainly not fun okay and so that can't be your day your day has to have some planning. Your day has to have some spontaneity. Now, I say planning as a person that is not really a planner, okay? I'm a live-in-the-moment type person. And do I love to sleep in? Yes. But do I sleep in every day? The answer is no. In our homeschool, we decided that we could have two sleep-in days, Thursday and Saturday. And that's what we had for a long time, Thursday and Saturday. Pick your days that will be sleep-in days, and the other days are not sleep-in days. Get up at a certain time. Have a time you start certain things where you say, you know what, the school day will start at 9 a.m. And when you say the school day will start, that doesn't mean they go to their computers and do their assignments necessarily. What that means is you're gonna sit down and have that spiritual time as a family. Maybe you're gonna have a devotional or something like that. You're gonna to pray together as a group. You're gonna plan what's most important for your family. And you're gonna talk about what fun things are gonna happen that day. And you don't have to be planning a birthday party every day, but you can make, just say something like, today we are gonna make sugar cookies and we are gonna shape them in the shapes of letters. And we're going to spell our names or whatever, you know? I mean, if you've got young learners, that is a riot. They love stuff like that. Or today, I'm going to teach you how to make salt dough, you know? But, but before we do that, say if you have a few things you have to do for the school, say, before we do that, we're going to take 20 minutes. And we're just going to go and say, we were here to our class. And then we're going to type in whatever you need. And guess what? I'll help you. No big deal. That's not the most important part of their day. The most important part of their day is what they're getting from you. The people are always more important than the to-do lists. We've got to remember that, or we will kill our children's love of learning. We'll kill their relationships with us during this time where we have the greatest opportunity as a world to have more freedom in what we learn and what we tell our children is most important. Do you realize the opportunity that we're getting? This is so exciting to me. So exciting. So, so I, I mean, I guess you can see how excited I am, but I'm so excited because I'm like freedom, finally freedom. Everyone thinks right now they don't have freedom, but this is ultimate freedom. You get to pick what they learn. You get to pick to, what do you do with your day. No schedules, no meetings, no work for most people. You get to pick all of that for who knows how long. You get to set a new normal. You get to put your family first because it's the only thing that matters right now. And truthfully, it's the only things that always matter. 
but we get distracted. But right now, we don't have to be distracted. I mean, you can sit and watch how many viruses are in your state every day if you want to. Just have it be part of your school day and then move on, you know? Like, don't worry about it. So um, have a meeting and say with the group, what are we going to do with this? What do you want to do? What are the fun things that you want to do? And then you make a list of all those cool, fun things you want to do. The books you want to read, the things they want to learn about. Maybe they've always wanted to learn to crochet or sew. They never have time because they're at school all day. Well, now they have time. People want, often wonder why some of those homeschool families turn out such amazingly confident children, such smart children. It's because they have a whole day to read as many books as they want, to do as many projects and to take away as many computer parts and what, as they want. And so what happens is they, they find a lot of skill development in all that stuff. And so they become confident. They're, they know there's nothing they can't learn. You have that opportunity to do that for your children right now. Every person has that opportunity right now. So set your priorities. What's number one important? At our house, if we do family canon and nothing else, which is, like I said, scripture, prayer, and stuff, that's the most important. Everything else doesn't even matter. Um, and then set certain days for the weeks. In our family, Friday has always been field trip day. Can you still do fr field trip Fridays? The answer is Yes, you can still do field trip Fridays. So decide what are some of the cool outdoor things, not, not museums and stuff like that, but what are some of the cool outdoor things that you can do right now? Okay, you can go on hikes, nature walks, make leaf collections, um, study different plants. You can, get, you can get books that tell you about different birds that are now going to be coming into your area, stuff like that. And you can go and watch things, study things. You can dig a hole in the yard and turn it into a fort and cover it over with something, you know? You can be like, let's test roofs. Let's do a grass roof. Let's do a wood roof. And let's do like a, a tin roof with this leftover for sale sign that we found in our garage, you know? Like, let's figure out what is the best roof that we should put on it. Let's go outside and measure our house by measuring the shadow that it casts at a certain time of day. That's an actual mathematic and scientific thing that you can do, and it's a field trip. You can also go to somebody's house, and you can sing to them. You can go to, you know, wherever, but something outdoors, there's places and things you can still go and visit. Go see petroglyphs, go hike a rock, go, you know, paint a picture in the woods. Go do something like that. And, and get all your supplies together that you can do. So now, um, what I usually do is I do my family canon, then I do my family school, which means I'm going to read to my children, and we're going to discuss and learn whatever I think that they should learn, okay? And then, when, then we usually hit about lunchtime or maybe right before lunch, and then what I do is I say, okay, so what are you going to accomplish today? So remember, we had these meetings, these mentor meetings. We have them every Sunday at our house. We make a plan for the week for each child. Child. And they'll look at their meetings or they'll think through what they know they have to do because of their meetings that they've had and the things on their schedule. And then they'll say, well, this is what I'm going to do today. I want to get through, excuse me, I want to get through this many math lessons. I want to read this book. I want to, you know, whatever it is, they'll list all those things out. And then I'll say, okay, well, at this time of day, let's do a checkup and see how you get to. So that's when you can say, okay, what do you need to do for your classes today? Okay, well, how about you go and do that? Let's spend, how long do you think it'll take? Maybe an hour, maybe a couple of hours, something like that. And if it's going to take too much time, do you need any help? You know, and you offer yourself and you move forward. The person in your home that should get the most of your attention, this is important for scheduling, okay, um, because you have to set your priorities, the, the person in, of all your children that gets the most of your attention should always be the youngest child, not the oldest child, okay? So the, if the youngest gets your attention, then the other children see what priorities look like, and they learn to sacrifice for younger people in their family. This is good for character development. Ah, I could go on and on and on. There are so many things that we could talk about. My time is done, and I even went over my 45-minute mark just a bit. In fact, we have hit an hour from when I started. Um, I'm sorry about that, but we're going to have some time for some question and answer. And so if you have any more questions and if we want to get into some more things, we can. I just, I just really want to leave you with um, a final thought, maybe, because I know maybe everyone's not going to stay for question and answer time. But 
you are meant for this. Um, I get a little emotional when I think about it. Those children that are in your home, they were born to you. They came to your house, to you. They weren't born to a school. They weren't born to a textbook. They weren't born to somebody else's plan for society. They were born to you. And finally, for the first time in modern history, the families of the world, the women of the world, are going to show the world what true power looks like, what true influence looks like. You guys, I've written 11 books. I've spoken at the United Nations. I have been all over the world training people. Never have I had greater influence than within the walls of my own home. Never. And you are the same. Every single one of you, and I know there's dads joining us too, but every single one of you, especially the mothers, you have such great power. And our whole world right now gets to listen to their mothers. We can change everything if we take the time to put the first things first. Stop worrying about the money, just learn how to make bread. Stop worrying about the, the pandemic, just learn how to use colloidal silver or apple cider vinegar or something, okay? Stop, stop worrying about all these different things. You're gonna make it through and your family can make it through being more powerful than before this whole thing began. In fact, I am convinced it is meant to be this way. I look at this whole thing as a global blessing. Sure, there's hardship, there's death, and there's sadness, but look what you get to do in your families right now. We are gonna post this for everybody to see in the world. It is my hope that it will go to the world. I'm giving this because parents, women, this is what the world needs to heal, not a vaccine. This is what every single person needs to find peace and security. They need a parent that's willing to do the hard thing of make a strong family culture. Next week, with no time to spare, on this day, we are going to have another event, a seminar. A heart of homeschool is what I'm calling it seminar because every parent is a homeschooler right now. And I hope that you will join me and that you'll tell your parents about it. If you go to heartofhomeschool.net and you join this event, it's going to be a one day event. I'm bringing in some of the best of the best as well as myself. And we are going to talk about some of the nuts and bolts that I couldn't cover in this short amount of time. I'm also going to answer some of your questions right now. You guys spread the good news. Embrace this and be happy. The good news about family, family truly is the most basic and fundamental unit of society. It says that in a UN document and other great documents. The family is the most basic and fundamental unit of society. That means it's even more important than church. It's even more important than work. It's more important than everything and we can do this. All right, I know some of you might have to go, and you can if you want, but if you want to stay with us, I'm going to answer people's questions. Sorry for going over just a little bit. Sorry for crying like a baby. I just couldn't help myself. Anyway, um, okay, so we have a lot of questions that have been submitted in the chat. I don't know if I'm going to get to all of them or not. Let's see what I can figure out here if I scroll through the chat. Uh, okay. Let's see here. 
uh, can I email the list with some more information? I will try to email out the list of fun activities, okay, for you, or I'll post them on Facebook somewhere or something like that. Um, I'll, we will, I'll do that. And um, then we'll give you even more stuff next week. Um, somebody says, my struggle is to not get overwhelmed and actually have the courage to do things that make messes. <laughs> so you might be more of a perfectionist mentality and you might like to have things clean in order to think clearly. Some people are like that. You know, we're all built a little differently, right? Um, she says, I'm hoping I can have enough energy for all that plus meals and and clean up. I suppose I have to let go of the illusion of control. Ha. Huh. Yes. Maybe a little bit, not really. Just control yourself. That's the most important thing. Uh, let go of the illusion of con the fact that you could control everything that happens around you. They're all learning and growing and that's going to happen all day no matter what. And so yeah, you can't control all of that. You can't make them turn into what you want them to be. They get to choose. It's part of being human. It's just part of the experience that we all have. Um, but I could give you a little tip there. And maybe the tip is um, hoping that you have energy for, for meals plus cleanup plus everything else. Clean as a family. Work as a family. Say, we're going to do 30 minutes of cleanup. Here's your jobs. You know, you do that. You do that. You do that. Uh, or we're all going to clean this room together right now today. Um, other things that I've done is I've said, okay, we're going to clean before each meal. And we're going to have like a 60 second pickup. And I'm going to count to 60 and I notoriously do it kind of slow. And, and we count to 60 and we clean up everything we can in the area. And then we eat our food. So we can and start again after we eat our food with you know no pickup here's the other thing they can go outside for a minute and ride their bikes or something like that in the yard while you make a food thing if you have to you know that's fine um, or they can just help you just teach them the culinary arts there's that too and I know some people like you're just not used to having them help you with everything and it takes way longer and you know what you're right but you have the time you're not going anywhere like you have the time. We all have the time right now. So just take the time. Make fancy things, make them together and eat them. So don't even worry about having time for cleanup and food because food and cleanup can be part of your school. In fact, they should be part of your school. They're life skills and that's part of the academic culture that you need. Okay, the next one says, um, uh, da, da, da. somebody's gonna knock out some ego projects that's great um, okay wonderful so now basically what we can do uh, Ben Wild has well actually it looks like Briny I know that face you've got your hand raised so go ahead and unmute yourself and ask any questions and if anybody else has questions then we will do the same thing there's a little button that says or a little thing that says you can raise your hand and that will let me know who can go next go ahead Briny okay so earlier on in the, the um, webinar you were talking about emotions and feeling stressed and overwhelmed during this time and you said something, you said um, something about some of you feel like your feelings are a truth for you. Um, can you go into that a little bit about feelings and emotions and, and buying into whether that's truth or not? Ooh, yeah. I mean, Bryony, you know me well enough to know that I could go into that for a, a day or, a, you know, at least an hour. We'll, we'll make this really short. So a lot of people think that when they feel something, um, some sort of an emotion, maybe stress, maybe worry, maybe sadness or something like that, that that means that they are experiencing um, some sort of a, an ultimate truth, not factoring in that that truth is logical, but also oftentimes heartfelt, spiritual. Okay. And so Emotions are part of our body voice lots of the times. They can be used by our heart voice or our spirit voice, you might want to say, but they also can hijack our ability to think clearly about other things. And so sometimes people think if they feel something, they have to down, you know, load it out on somebody else. And that's kind of a popular psychology thing that has taken over the world. For sure, the Western society. Um, 
And people think if you can't share your emotions or if you don't share your emotions, then you're being forced to stuff your emotions. And so maybe you, people have heard you, you know, people say stuff like that. Um, and I'm not talking about stuffing emotions. I'm talking about the right time to talk about them. You know, and I think that's the big thing is that people are getting, um, caught up in their emotions and so the emotions then are hijacking the connection if you're feeling emotional you can't connect with other people very well um emotions are the way that you that the, the media uses to control you okay candidates who are running for office uh, people who are are advertising to you they always say you got to put emotion in there it's got to be a story got to be something like that because that's how they manipulate you. So usually emotions are part of some sort of a power struggle. And so that's why you have to get to a place of calmness first and then talk about how you might be feeling about something. We're human. We have feelings. It's part of being a human person. But um, it, we shouldn't be acting in the heat of those feelings in that way all the time. Now that's different than getting a, like a spiritual feeling. Sometimes I might get a spiritual feeling like, I need to do this. I need to say this to this person. That's different than feeling like somebody doesn't care or feeling like it's too overwhelming because those are things where I'm actually just catering to emotional or chemical to stresses. I'm defeating myself with a dialogue that's going on inside my head. That's different than some other types of feelings. So maybe what we really should do is break out um, useful feelings, feelings that don't betray versus feelings that do betray. And, and when feelings need to be talked about, that could be an entire class, but I hope that helps you just a little bit. Good question. We've got two other people who have their hands raised. Let's see who we've got raising hands. Um, we've got Heidi's iPhone raising their hand. You want to unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. I have a question about teenagers. I've homeschooled before and we've done a lot of devotionals in the past, but my kids currently go to a charter school. I'm worried about motivating them to kind of go back to what we used to do and they're thinking that um, mom's manipulative or taking control. Like, I really want to do these devotionals again. I'm excited about it. It's great fun. But I've had a lot of kickback, like kids sleeping in, let's not have a schedule. You're not in charge of our life, <laughs> this kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming... Yeah, I'm assuming those children are in their teen years. That's my guess. Yes, but, the youngest is 11, but they're mostly up okay. to 18. Well, and the thing is, is the youngers are going to follow the older ones. Um, so your, your 18 year old has probably been pretty much doing whatever they want to all the time because they can drive and they can whatever, and they go to their friends and they go to their school. And now all of a sudden there's all this other stuff and they don't want that to, they don't want their own, probably what they feel like control to change. Um, you're getting a really big blessing here to try and make things healthy. I think you need to sit down with them and say, what makes a healthy family? What okay. makes healthy family connections? So let's make a list of what that looks like. If our family is healthy and has healthy family connections, what's the role of a mother? What's the role of a father? What's the role of a child? That book that I held up before that book rolls. Um, it's on audible if you like it in audio, but oh, you awesome. Also you can also read it. There's some conversations that are had in that book that you would probably want to have with your children um, because those types of attitudes are actually called dysfunction, Heidi. So um, they're, they're trying to usurp your authority and your role in the home, and that will make the whole family dysfunctional. So you can't allow it to happen. Even if they're giving you pushback, do not fall for that. You have to be the leader. They are not the leader in this time or, or any time when you're a parent. I mean, this goes for no matter what, you know, crisis is happening or not, right? So, um, so what you need to do is you need to have some conversations, some productive conversations about who you are in the family, what your jobs are, and then they need to understand, you know, this is what's going to happen so that I can do my role. Um, I've always been a homeschooler, even though you've been going to charter school, um, but now we have time to do our school even better than we did before. Now you have time to learn things you want to learn that you didn't have time to before. So we're going to make a list of what things you want to learn and you want to do and fun things that we can do as a family. 
And if you don't make any items on the list, that's okay. I'm going to make a list too, and we're just going to carry on. Um, your 18-year-old will probably need a little bit more time by themselves to do their own study if they are truly scholars. So when my children get older, then I don't do as much family school time with the olders, and they get a little bit more independent study time. But they do have to tell me what they're going to be working on, and then tell me afterward what they did work on. Okay? Awesome. So you can also give them a little bit more freedom in that way, but, but you really cannot take that. You have to say, Oh, I'm sorry. It's, you know, um, it's not your role to determine uh, how we're going to run each day here as a family. Do you recommend reading that role book as a family or a lot of people do. A lot of people do. Um, the, the children in the book are between the ages of 18 and eight because it's a story. Awesome. So get that book either if you want audible or if you, I mean, if you're going to read it, just get the book. It's probably more fun to, to read it out loud together. Anyway, good question. So someone asked Thank us, you. yes. So, and just be sure to mute yourself when we're done with your questions. Um, Sonia asked, will the homeschool seminar be free next week or will there be a cost? Um, there is a cost for it. We are going to do some advertising to get it out there. We have to pay for that. We have to pay for hosting and some different things, but, um, it, so it will be $30 for that. Obviously, if there is someone in extenuating circumstances, <laughs> they can contact me and I'm not going to turn anybody away, but um, it's, yeah, it's $30, which is super cheap. And so if you go to heartofhomeschool.net and you register there, it's $30 for next Saturday. Um, then we had another person raising their hand. Maybe. I don't, there's so many of you here. I'm only seeing Heidi's phone. Does anybody else have their hand raised or no? Okay, so he Heidi's um, already, we already did that one. So if anyone else wants to raise their hand, they can. This says, uh, my issue is my teen that wants to disagree with any instruction that I give. Okay, so I'll just answer that really quick. That's from Jennifer. Um, and your children, absolutely, um, need to follow your instructions. If they don't follow your instructions, you actually can't parent them, which is going to turn your home into a war zone. So you do need to teach them the skills for how to disagree with you in an appropriate way. So, um, and I am going to talk about those skills next week at, at length, but basically you um, teach them to look at you, keep a calm face, voice, and body, uh, say that they understand your point of view, share their point of view, listen to what you have to say, then say okay, and drop the subject. They also need to learn the five-step process for how to follow instructions as well. And, and I know that some of the teens, there's going to be pushback on this, but you need to explain to them, if we know these skills, you get more of what you want. We don't have to, we don't have to fight about things. You can explain things to me. If you disagree appropriately with me, probably nine times out of 10, I'm going to see your side and, and you can get things that you want. Maybe don't say nine times out of 10 if they ask you for computer games like every five minutes. But, um, but also they have to drop the subject at the end, which means once you've talked about one thing, it doesn't need to come up again that day, right? So that's a good thing. Um, if your child is oppositional and disagreeing with everything you tell them to do, then that means they have a problem with your role. Again, you would probably want to read that roles book. So it's called Roles, The Secret to Family, Business, and Social Success, um, because that's showing that there is a lack of disregard there, which means that your relationship is in a, in a bad state. And that roles book would help you uh, get some steps, put some steps into place for how to help them see you want to help make their life great. You don't want to restrict their life. That's not the point of what we're doing here. We're helping, we want to help them launch, you know? Okay, Cherie, your hand is up. Okay, I have two questions actually, one for you and one for David Egertson. So he just has to listen for a second. I'm not exactly sure he's on, to be honest. <laughs> oh, he no. was like, Nicolene, I have a service project I have to do today. I'm not sure I'll be on through the whole time. So <laughs> he may or may not be here, but you can try and see if he'll ask. Okay, okay. so mine's a quick one. I know that you were saying that emotions, the, the emotions topic would take like a whole day to cover, right? So I'm wondering, you know, for those of us that are on the implementation program on your website, 
where where can I get a lot of that information on um, emotions and the appropriate times to be able to go through that and, and when it would be appropriate to talk about certain emotions? You know how you were covering that with that last question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I and I, I would actually say probably the majority of that is going to be in the teaching self-government support group. Okay. Because um, there's question, a lot of questions in there about people about emotions and stuff like that. And I've probably answered many, many people's questions, you know, over the years and they're okay. all recorded there. Try that. Um, there might be some stuff in the tone of the home, seeking to understand. Um, anything about seeking to understand is going to be an important one to do. Okay. Uh, it is, you know, for the people who teach the teaching self-government stuff, the mentors, I actually did a whole day on feelings and emotions for them a couple of years ago. And that was not like recorded for everybody else to see, but it is something that I could put together, Cherie. It's something that I have. Usually we just start at the basic level for everybody and then move on from there. Um, so I usually try to tell people right now, just remember a lot of your catering to any emotion. It is a choice. You can choose. Do I want to have that emotion right now or do I not want to? And I think that's the most important thing. Can you tell yourself no sometimes when it's not the right time? The answer is yes, we can do that. And so I think um, that's probably the biggest thing that I focus on and that people should not be allowed to emotionally throw up all over each other. It's not healthy. It's not good. Um, and so there has to be a right time to talk about emotions. And usually if you read my um, books or, or in the implementation course, if you, the bits on um, parent counseling meetings, that's going to be the appropriate time. If somebody needs to talk about something, have a little parent counseling meeting with them about what they're feeling, but do that after the person has gotten calm and they're able to follow instructions. The emotions should not have to be vented before a person chooses to be in control. We need to discuss them, discuss feelings, but that doesn't mean that it has to happen first just because they feel it right then. And that's the part where society's getting off pace. And that's why everybody's turning wild and they're bullying everybody and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, thank you, um, Cherie. I, I did want I, I Oh, did yeah, want one other one. What's up? your other one? <laughs> thank you. I, I know that David Egertson, when we went to the parenting conference a month ago, uh -huh. he recorded an emotional, he, he recorded when you were talking about emotions. Um, oh, yeah. And so I just wanted to remind him, he was talking about maybe posting that. And I was like, oh, I really want that. <laughs> okay. Send, so him an e send him an email. He's going to hate that I say this to the whole world, but David at teaching selfgovernment.com. Okay. Send him an email okay, and, thank you. and just tell him that that would be great. Okay. Um, so Heidi, I, I've answered a question from you and Sonia. So I'm going to go ahead and let you go again. Did you have another question, Heidi? Oh, and we've got uh, Christy's raising an actual hand. Is that, or is that your child's hand? I don't know. I can't tell. Um, Heidi, did you have another question? No, I, sorry. I'm just learning how to use this. That's fine. I'll lower your hand. Okay, Sonia, did you have a question? Oh, sorry. It's La Sonia. I am just seeing the middle word. My apologies. I just butchered your name. A person with a name like Nicoline should never butcher another person's name. So I apologize for that because mine's been butchered my whole life. So La Sonia, please. You'd have to can unmute you? yourself. Oh, there okay. we go. I can hear you now. Um, I wanted to find out the, the last part of your um, statement before you started taking the questions. And you said that that would be available to share with every, you know, so that other people could see Oh, yeah. So maybe you're yeah, talking about, about this, this blessing and this time. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. You were you cut out on my side a little bit. I don't know if your internet connection maybe is a little spotty. I'm not sure. Can but but I, I did hear me. I can hear you now. But I, what I'm hearing you say, just tell me if I got this right, is you're wondering how you're going to be able to make this available to other people. Is that what you're wondering? Your, your last statement where you were talking about the women and the, um, the importance of this time. 
Um, yes. So, uh, thank you. And, and by the way, women are dear to my heart because I'm also president of the worldwide organization for women which is an international organization. Many people don't know. That's why I go to the, U the United Nations and stuff like that. And that's why I made those statements about women because it, it really is dear to my heart, um, the power that women and mothers have. Anyway, um, that will be attached to this webinar. And this webinar will be available on YouTube. It's live on YouTube right now. And that will also be available. We'll put it on Facebook. We'll make it available on the website where we've just, where you guys signed up for this. We'll probably end up just getting, be, get, get replaced with this webinar. We'll just live there. So you'll be able to send your, your family and friends to it. So that would be the homeschool, heartofhomeschool.net slash webinar that that i'm guessing i'm pretty sure that's what david said he was going to do if you haven't you know guessed it david's kind of my right hand man on technology anyway but then you can share that with people um we could probably segment out a couple of pieces on it obviously and we could you know make that just that piece available that's a a possibility that would probably make a really awesome facebook post wouldn't it maybe i'll work on that for you Yes, that would be, be absolutely awesome because I think that needs to be shared with more, more women and, and and I'm a single mother right now, and so I I definitely believe in that and um, I just think that more people need to hear that. Okay, awesome. Well, bless you, Lasonia, for all that you're doing during this crazy time, being a single mom too. Um, that brings a whole new level of complexity to what we're talking about. Um, so maybe you could also email David at teachingselfgovernment.com and just tell him that right now. Just be like, hey, David, that bit at the end where Nicolene was talking, that needs to go out live to people. Can you cut us a piece off? Because he's going to be the one that's going to help do that. Okay, uh, let's see if there's anything else. Um, Candace says, I have nine children, the two oldest in public school, four that I homeschool, two preschoolers, and a baby. Wow, that sounds like a fun place. I'm so excited to have the oldest two home, but dealing with attitudes in a, is a struggle. Do I start dealing with negative attitudes first or start focusing on the positive first? Ah, I like that you're thinking in those directions. I'd love to begin with the the day with a family canon, but I know they will cause trouble because they want to do their own school first. Now there's something to be said for doing your math first. And I just want to say that math in the morning is a beautiful thing. You should do your math in the morning <laughs> anyway. And so there have been many times where my children have woken up and the first thing they do is their math. And then we start our day. Um, the other things can probably wait. I mean, I understand wanting to get them taken care of and get them done, but that's why your family has to decide what is our schedule going to be. Is family canning going to happen at 11 or is it going to happen at nine? You don't have to have my exact same schedule. You can pick your own schedule. You can say, okay, when is our day going to have this stuff happen? But if your children go to an online school portal first thing in the morning, I do want you to know their brains will disconnect from being able to have better relationships in the day. That is a true thing. It's just like watching TV or watching YouTube videos or something first thing in the morning. It is not good for your brain. And it makes all your relationships uh, suffer. So what I would suggest doing is if they want to get the math done first, fine, get that done first. But then I would have a, a time with the family groups and connects. And I mean, even if it's only 20 or 30 minutes, and then they get the opportunity to go back to get some of their other things done, but then make sure everybody breaks for a lunch, you know, and you talk about a few things and then make sure that you have a time where, you know, the family reads together. It's okay to read to high schoolers. We still read out loud as a family in our home. And, you know, my daughter who's in college, you know, she's like 20, was she almost 22? And she loves to sit and listen to me read because that was just part of her life. So it's okay to have that even when they're older, you know, don't take all their time though. Cause if their studies take a little bit more, more time, but you should make this time very obvious that you can pick to do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. And you can 
have more time for fun. If everybody wakes up late and then only does their online school and then just wants to sit around and watch TV all day, it's not a very good life. It's really not. They may think that's the good life. There's no connection, no excitement, no spontaneity, spontaneity, no attachment. La, 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 if I could talk right. Anyway, um, so you're saying, what should I do? Should I uh, deal with the negative attitudes or start focusing on the positive first? Um, you're going to want to give people a vision of what's coming first. Okay, so what are we going to do? What are we going to do at this time? It could last forever. Schools in, I think, California, Arizona, they've canceled for the whole year. Um, other places have canceled for the whole year. It's happening. It's probably going to happen everywhere with what's happening with this pandemic, okay? So now what are we going to do? This is the new normal. We can't be wishing that things were back the way they were because they're not. This is the way they are, so let's make a plan. And that's called accepting a no answer. If they don't get things their way, they have to accept a no answer. And then you'll have to learn how to correct them and stuff like that. And I'm going to do a whole class all about correcting negative behaviors before they start next week in the seminar, the Heart of Homeschool one day seminar that we're going to do next Saturday. So anyway, that will help more with that. But definitely praise, you know, like I said, praise things. That's important, super important. Um, let's see. I think that one also we just answered. Okay, uh, Rebecca, you've got your hand raised. Oh, unmute yourself. I can't hear you. There you go. Yeah, hi. Why do you call it family canon? It's not a big deal, but I was just curious why you call it family canon. Sure. It, it's, you don't have to call yours that. You can call it devotional. You can call it whatever you want. Okay. But I, ca I call it canon because the canon of the Bible, um, those first books in the Bible are what everything else in the whole Bible is compared to. Like that's the whole point of the canon. It's like the beginning of it all, you know, and, and everything. And so my family canon is it's the beginning of it all. It's the beginning of the day. And it's what we, and it's what we balance our whole day to. So um, we, we balance it god wise so there's prayer scripture okay that comes in but we also do a family mission statement so we balance our day to who we are as a family we also oftentimes do memorizations like we might memorize mother goose we might memorize something an inspiring poem you know or something like that and that is also something that we're gonna you know we've picked something inspirational for a reason it's something we can balance the rest of our studies to for the rest of the day it's a bonding time as a family again putting first things first so um that's why i call it the canon not okay. because it's like boom a canon you know not like that yeah well no i just want to know your reason for. why i always yeah. like to know reason behind things too sure um in the mornings is your husband joining you or is this just your kids so are you mm. still spiritual thing along with the come follow me program now, or do you do that in the morning now or like I, I almost feel like you know that's we're so absorbed with trying to get a, a, a way more spiritual in which is a good thing it's really good but at the same time you know when you're with your kids all day and I'm like okay and now we're going to it so it's almost like a you know the circus production well that's actually one reason I do our spiritual first because um, that needs to be the most important thing. And, and we need to be the freshest for that so that we can discuss and everything else. And, and so I know some families, dad leaves really early or something. And so maybe he's not going to be there for that. My husband is only there for family canon, like a small percentage of the time. Usually it's just me and the children. And we will do um, any of our lessons and discussions and things related to gospel learning happens during that time. But then... Um, you can also do, we also have a time at the end of the day where we have a family prayer. I know that some families will do a separate little, like just read a little bit maybe in their scriptures and discuss it at night with dad, where it's like a special time with dad because he couldn't be there for the other bit. Uh, you can have two. You don't just have to have one. And the, the canon though, for us, that's part of our school day. Like that's, that's a part of the school day. So whether dad's there or not, we're going to do it. If dad can be there, then great. But I also don't want people so fresh out of bed that they can't even think, you know, and sometimes yeah. if dad leads early, that's what some people have to do. My parents tried to have, you know, devotional every morning before my dad would leave for work and he would leave at like six something and they pull us out of bed and we're like, you know, there's no way we're, fo we're processing any of it. And I want it to be a time of really great processing. So we usually get up, do some 
some personal maintenance, teeth brushing, showers, you know, all that kind of stuff, maybe chores. And then like at nine or somewhere around there, historically we've started our canon at nine. My children are such self-directed learners now. We don't always necessarily have our canon at nine per se. Um, sometimes because they're so self-directed in their college studies and stuff, because London's a full-time college student and she does online college, you know, sometimes she'll get up and get going on something and she'll be like, mom, I need to finish this paper first. Can I do that before we do canon? And I'll be like, yeah, that's fine. Right. And so then I, I might adjust it just a teeny bit. So we do get going until that moment where canon happens, but canon is like the, the center cog of the whole day, really. Okay. That's true. Okay. Thank you. And I appreciate yeah. you doing this. You've hit a lot of feelers today and I really needed this. So thank you. My pleasure. Totally. My pleasure and honor, Rebecca. Thanks. Okay. Let's take your hand down. Anisha, your hand is up next. You'll have to unmute yourself. Anisha Hill, are you still with us? Maybe she's handling something. Um, okay, here's another question while we're waiting for her. I have lists for the kids to do every day and we do homeschool and family reading, but when they're done, I allow them to watch movies. Is that setting up screens as the fun thing? Ooh, this is a good question. <laughs> or is that a nice downtime to allow them after doing their work? That's from Laura. Laura, great question there. Um, your intuition is right. You are setting up the screens as the fun thing. Um, and so you're going to want to be careful about that. That doesn't mean you can't ever watch screens. You know, um, for years and years, our family has been a, okay, we only watch a family movie night on Friday nights and that's it. And we just haven't been screens people at all. Well, now I have two people at home that are all older. And I, I explained this to my older children, like, well, you didn't get us watch as much screen stuff as the youngers because there were youngers when you were older. That's just how it goes when you're an older person in a family. Okay. And so, and so my two youngers now are 18 and 16 and well, almost 16 in a couple of days anyway. And, um, these two, these two youngers, you know, we might occasionally go, Oh, let's go watch a, a monk, you know, one of those like old detective shows, or let's go watch, you know, a, a something like that anyway. And so we might occasionally do that, you know, in an evening time, but no, I wouldn't just be like whiling away the days with it. I would be playing games. I would be getting out there and doing stuff. Um, my guess is it's easier for you to just say, let's do screens because then they're entertained and you can do your thing. And sometimes that feels nice to have a little bit of your own private time. But I'll tell you what even feels better. What even feels better is when you see a person grow up and hit adult age and not just want to watch TV every day with their spare time. When they want to play games as a family and go on walks with you and do some project or some craft or, Hey, brother and sister, let's paint. Let's do something like Paige initiated this last weekend with, with my two younger children that were at home. Um, and that's what they did for an evening instead of, TV and we played games. That's when you're like, wow, this person knows how to problem solve even their own boredom or their own things that they want to do. If we always let them do screens, they don't ever learn how to make something for themselves to do, which is a vital life skill and will make them not be addicted to having to be entertained. So don't beat yourself up, but definitely make an adjustment. They're not going to like the adjustment. You're going to need the skill, how to accept a no answer, how to disagree appropriately. And you're going to want to make a set family plan. Um, the, the biggest thing is that if you just say, this is when we will watch a show and this is when we won't, and it's going to be a certain kind of a show. And you just say, these days we might watch a show. These days we won't just plan it. And then you can all, then the times when it's not those days, you can say no and you can do something else. Okay. Anisha says she can't unmute herself. So I will unmute you. 
Hey, hey. Go, go Anisha. Hey, thank you. I was trying to type it out. I've got a baby on my lap though. Um, I have lots of little kids and um, when we first started initializing the, the basic skills and, and everything, the vision, uh, what was coming to my attention is that I could spend my entire day just correcting and doing extra chores. And it would be, literally, it just wore me out with <laughs> correcting and doing extra chores. And, and it was frustrating. And I also would lose my cool a lot. Um, uh, obviously repenting and and I'm a great example of repenting to my children but <laughs> Good. what what I'm trying to ask is and I maybe I've already answered this because I've done it I, there have been times when I've just taken a break from identifying incorrect behaviors or inappropriate behaviors and just tried to like connect with them again is that something that you can recommend and are there certain times when you shouldn't do that I'm also worried that maybe at those times, my kids are like, oh, yay, mom's back. We can, like, be fun again or something. Okay. Um, you're actually hitting on quite a few things here. But, but one thing I want to address first is that oh. you should, there shouldn't be a difference between you connecting to your children and you correcting your children, actually. Um, so when you... When you correct your children, you should be connecting to your children. You should be looking at them, thinking, I love you, thinking, I want to understand you, saying, you know, you can always disagree appropriately here. This is what we're going to talk about. It shouldn't be a place of disconnect. So if you, feel, if you feel like you're getting disconnected when you're correcting the children, that means you're taking things personally and you're actually becoming emotional. Oh, that's very, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's probably what's happening. So what you need to be doing is you need to be thinking, this is just a thing. What I'm, I need to describe what I see. This person's not trying to be evil or wicked. I just need to help them know which direction to go because I'm the leader. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's what you do. You think, I got to think of the best here. I got to trust that they'll learn and they can do this. And, and if they get that spirit of trust and love and that feeling of this is okay, mom doesn't get bugged by having to correct me either. Number one, they won't power struggle against you as much because it just doesn't produce anything and number two um they'll actually feel like oh it's okay it's okay to be corrected over time they may you know at first not say i love being corrected but over time <laughs> it'll be okay now the first part of your question you said you feel like you're correcting all the time um mm -hmm. you, when you're trying to be consistent it can feel like that you're you're seeing a lot of things and correcting all the time i think probably you're missing a little bit of the mercy where occasionally you need to say to a person Okay, so right now, um, I'm going to do a correction. Remember, you can always disagree appropriately, okay? Or right now, I'm going to give you a no answer about something. Remember, you can always disagree appropriately. You should be opening the door to more talk, okay, instead of, instead of just trying to shut somebody down. Correcting isn't about shutting somebody down. It's not about taking control. Correcting is about helping a person recognize where they're at and then switch course. And so if you can see yourself as a guide instead of a person that is just like snapping down the hammer all the time, because if yeah. you feel like you have to be the heavy, you're going to get emotional every time. Yeah. But you shouldn't, but you shouldn't have to be the heavy. You just have to point out what's happening. It's just a moment, a moment of honesty that happens in the family. So, you know, next week I am going to do a whole class on correcting children. And I feel like that's going to maybe fill in a few pieces for you that maybe you might be missing, which could right. be super helpful. If you are going to join that event, that could be a helpful thing for you. Um, I think the biggest thing right now is describe, don't react. Okay. Describe, don't react. That's important. Just describe what you see happening and what should be happening and, and work through your corrections with a tone of description instead of a tone of reaction. Okay. Um, okay. But keep correcting and being consistent, but don't be like so meticulous that you're like, um, I saw your eyes shift to the side. You're clearly not looking at me, you know, like, don't, don't go crazy. You know, I mean, if, cause a person, sometimes there's something catches their eye and then they'll look at you again. And then, you know, that doesn't mean they're being disrespectful. If they're looking at you and they're trying to do everything else. Sometimes I think we try to like make it too much in our heads too. So be careful about that. I mean, you have to be enough understanding in the process of correcting and consistent all at the same time 
um, so that it actually helps the person forward instead of um, feels like they're get, they feel like they're getting shut shut down all the time. So okay. cool. Good question. Super good question. Um, that looks like that's kind of our last question. And we really have hit a point in time where we need to be done with this. And, and I'm glad we were able to get this live on YouTube. I appreciate everyone who stayed with us and joined us for the question and answer session that we had here at the end. Next week, there's more to come. If you sign up for the Heart of Homeschool seminar, you're all homeschoolers. We all are, every single person, even if your children went back to school tomorrow, you're still a homeschooler because you are still the person that shows them what the real purpose of life is, where happiness comes from and where their priorities should be. You get to teach that no matter where they learn math. And I'm going to have a person on there uh, on the seminar who is an expert at teaching children math and not necessarily having to be versed in all of the different math books and knowing every single math, everything out there in the world. And so that's going to be fun for you to, to hopefully be part of. Anyway, it's going to be a neat list of people that are going to be joining us. Honestly, these women that are joining us are some dear friends of mine and they are just great people and they have the heart of good homeschoolers. And so that's why I invited them to be part of this. I, I couldn't invite every single friend of mine that had the heart of a great homeschooler, which I could have done. Um, but, but I've got four friends that are going to be joining me and then I'll do some, some sessions for you too, but it's going to be a fun day. It'll be from eight 45 in the morning. This is mountain time. I know everybody's from every which way. So do the calculation eight 45 in the morning, mountain time until four 15 PM mountain time. So if you're Eastern, that's going to be like ending right at dinner time. That's what we tried to do so that nobody would go into the dinner hour anyway. Um, and then there'll be a lunch break and stuff like that, but it's, it's going to be a really great day. This has been a really great morning. I appreciate all the people who chose to come on. I hope that because you were here, it'll bless your family. I hope that it will also inspire all your friends. I hope you'll share this with them because we're going to make it available. We, we want people to shine during this time, not to feel like uh, things are dark and cloudy. Anyway, uh, thank you for joining me, everyone. And we will hopefully see some of you next week. Bye-bye.